um, because we do actually get a fair number of people who watch this um, at some other time. So we'll give them the opportunity to participate. Obviously they won't get a chance to ask enlightening questions of Michael, but um, I'm sure I'm sure this group will do that in its place. Uh, so thank you for uh, participating in Kenwood's Lunch and Learn event today. Uh, our guest speaker is Michael Gordon. Um, I've known Michael for many years. He's the former um, regional president for Accelerant. That's how I got to know him. But more recently, he has been working with companies uh, and clients um, to enhance their networking capabilities, strategies. Um, and, I, and I think he, because um, I've heard many of his stories before, is extremely well versed in this topic, has some really creative ideas, and I think will provide some really unique insights to, to uh, how to better our networking capabilities. So, Michael, I'm going to now make you the host. Okay. Uh, again, if you could just keep an eye on the uh, participants in, in case we have anybody else who shows up late um, and you can let them in. Yep. Oops. Okay, you should be getting a link to do that. Yep, I got it. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and I'll uh, go right to, to my slide deck. Let me share it this way. Um, All right, well, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Who's that? Okay. That was me. I had something on. It came on loud. I didn't, I apologize. No, it's okay. It's been um, you. Well, Bill, thanks for, for allowing me to do this. Um, this is, um, it's just a topic that I never thought in a million years in my wildest dreams that I would be talking about. <laughs> So it's kind of uh, surreal to be here uh, to do it. And, um, and I'm thankful to everybody for showing up. So from a, when you hear the word networking, uh, this will be a little interactive. What do you think of? Um, how would you define networking? Feel free to, to shout it out. I would say, um meeting new groups of people with the potential opportunity to expand your business um, or expand your life personally, just reaching out, meeting, greeting, and learning. Good one. Who else? I would say awkward. Yep, that's a word I've heard used before. Russell, come on, you're a, you're a networker. You're muted. I was muted. Uh, so networking, a, a lot of things, me specifically, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working to try and meet people who, who can help me and I can help them with our business growth. Specifically, yep. I, I'm, I'm blessed to know a whole bunch of people with so many siblings that I have and whatnot, but they're, they're not who are going to help me with my business necessarily. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, so thanks for sharing that. Um, I have a couple of definitions that I'll share with you. Uh, the first one, hey Bill, would you, would you mind reading this one? Networking, the cultivation of productive relationships for employment or business. From Mr. Webster. Exactly. Here's another one that I found that I find actually a little more interesting and maybe a little more apropos um, or resonates more with me. Holly, do you want to read this one? Sure. A networking, a full contact sport where you take no prisoners and gather as many business cards as possible. Always be closing. A former sales rep. That's how I experience it. Yeah. And, and thank you for doing that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, this is when I think about my history of networking in my early days, this is really what I thought it was all about. I thought it was important to go out and just meet as many people as I can and collect a bunch of business cards and I would bring them back to my office. They'd ultimately end up in a drawer, never really to be seen again, maybe one or two based on a conversation that I had, but ultimately it never really went anywhere. So 
as Bill said, I'm Michael Gordon. I got to meet him through a mutual friend years ago, uh, successfully tricked him into joining a networking group that I was uh, running here in the DC and Baltimore area. And I say that tongue in cheek, so I'm glad everybody's smiling and laughing. Um, I've got nothing to sell you here today. This is just a topic that I feel really strongly about and, and never in my wildest dreams thought I would be talking to people about this. My goal is to leave you with some very tangible things that you can do to increase the return on your investment of time when it comes to networking. So that's the goal, increase your return on your time when it comes to networking. So here's what networking means to me. This, is, this would be the Michael Gordon definition. New friendships, and I use friendships specifically versus relationships. I have a relationship with the guy who cuts my grass, but I don't really network with him. So I talk about friendships. Those friendships, lead me to access to decision makers that I would like to be doing business with. So as a result of the friendships, I'm meeting the people that can actually make a decision to engage me. And when it's done that way, it results in closed business, faster and easier. So this is what networking means to me as it relates to business development. So here's what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not gonna talk about what events I think you should go to and how to work the room and what questions you should be asking to make yourself seem really engaged and interested in the people that you're meeting. That's not, that's not what I'm gonna talk about. I will talk about networking as it relates to generating new business. I'll tell you a little bit about my personal journey, but as it relates specifically to this topic. And then at the end, I'll share with you some things that I believe you can do to increase your, your ROI. So when I ask the question, this is we're going back into interactive mode. When I ask you the question, what obstacles stand in your way of getting new business? How would you answer that? And again, feel free to just shout it out. I'd say well, Rob, would you the right, oops, I'm sorry, Russell. No, Bill, you first, you first. Uh, finding the right people to meet. Yep. Russell? Over committing to things that probably aren't going to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of that. What do you mean? Uh, you know, I'm really involved in the Greater Bethesda Chamber of Commerce and I'm their chair elect coming in. And it, it, it doesn't force me, but I'm in meetings where it's really not the room that's going to provide me the opportunity directly to close more business or build my business. Indirectly, there's always that hope, but right. Yeah, good one, thank you. Anybody else? I was gonna kind of piggyback off what was said previously, um, not finding the right leads or finding the right leads, but it's not necessarily the right contact. They can't get you over that hump. Yep. Anyone else? It's okay if you don't. All right. So what I find is like Bill, and I think all of you said, getting access to the decision maker. There are lots of obstacles that stand in the way. It could be lack of time. It could be COVID. It could be qualified leads. There are so many different obstacles that stand in our way. But after over 15 years of talking with people who are in a role that's responsible to bring in new business, the number one overarching challenge that I believe that they all think if they could remove it, they would be more successful is getting access to the decision maker. Because we we all know the term gatekeeper, right? There's lots of gatekeepers that keep us, their sole job is to keep us away from those decision makers because everyone's trying to get their attention, right? So access. So if you buy into the belief that that is actually the obstacle, where, where does the best new business come from? And I'll define best for you. To me, best means the longest lasting, the most enjoyable, and the most profitable. 
where does that type of business come from? I'd say genuine friendships. Yep. Will that trust you? Yep. Um, I think word of mouth through people that you already have that with, and then you can build that with newcomers. Yep. yep. Any, any others? Certainly a referral source, a direct referral source. Yeah, that's where we're headed. I believe, and again, by the way, everybody, this is all Michael Gordon's opinion, so you can take it for what it's worth. We'll put an asterisk next to all of the statements made. These are not the opinions of Kenwood management, <laughs> um, but I'm, I think Bill would agree with a lot of this. I believe that the best new business absolutely comes from a referral, from somebody who knows you and trusts you and introduces you to someone that you're able to do business with in the future. So again, if you buy into this belief, here are some rhetorical questions that if you haven't asked yourself, I would consider, cons I would cons have you consider thinking about these things as you go forward. So one, do you know who your best referral sources are? How, uh, how many referral sources do you actually have? What is your referral gathering strategy? If you even have one, a lot of people don't. And then where do you spend time gathering referrals? Not everybody thinks about these specific things because referrals are just a natural part of how you do what you do. But I would encourage you to think about them and if referrals are where you do get quality business from, maybe think about how to increase the quality of those things. So networking options. This is always a fun part. So um, in, in my experience, there are really four options available to us in the, in the B2B community for networking. You've got networking groups like the Chamber of Commerce, BNI, et cetera. You have the social, charitable, and philanthropic organizations, whether it's a country club or a nonprofit that you might be involved with. You have peer groups, and some of these terms may or may not be familiar, but Vistage, LX Council, the Alternative Board, peer groups are where CEOs get together to talk about being better leaders. Uh, and then you also have your industry, trade groups, associations, etc. Outside of these four, and I know that there are other things, but pretty much everything else, in my opinion, would fall under one of these areas. And given that, given that, sorry, advance, I believe each one of them is is flawed and it's not that the people are bad and it's not that the intention isn't right but there are flaws in my opinion as it relates to the quality of the time that you're spending invested in these groups and let me let me explain so networking groups in many cases it's the wrong people not bad people but wrong people and further defined non-decision makers. If you go to events, you know, networking events at, and again, there's nothing wrong with the chamber. They do a lot of great things, but my sense is you're typically surrounded by non-decision makers in those networking environments versus a room full of people that can actually buy your product or service. Nonprofit, those social, charitable, and philanthropic, there might be good people involved. If you get on the board of a charity, great people to network with, but it's really the wrong goal. Peer groups, those CEO only, lonely at the top, trusted board of advisors, wrong topic. Can you network with the other members of your peer group? Absolutely. Are they good potential prospects? For sure. But is that really why you're showing up there to network. And then lastly, your trade association, unless you're in the legal profession, where a lot of referrals are, happen from lawyer to lawyer, 
those trade associations are generally filled with all your competitors. And I'm not suggesting that you can't be successful in these environments and get new business from them. I'm just saying that I believe that there's a more effective way to invest your time to overcome these flaws. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I've done. I'm gonna share with you a little bit about what I do and then most importantly, how I do it as it relates to, to this topic. So Russell and Bill, you are the only ones that I'm aware of that are familiar with Accelerant, but back in 2006, uh, I moved to the Northern Virginia market from Philadelphia, same neighborhood as Will Smith, by the way, um, and launched this thing called Accelerant. And what we found was that in our quest to address those flaws that existed in the market, wrong people, wrong topic, wrong goal, or full of competitors, this was an environment that we were creating. Um, and I spent the better part of 12 and a half years running small groups of people that were invited to participate to focus on building the relationships inside the group and then helping them make the connections and referrals outside of the group. So I'm only sharing that to give you a little bit of context that for the better part of the last 15 years, I've been in the networking slash relationship development business. Today, what I do is network development systems and that's where I basically help people do the things that I'm about to share with you in an effort to increase the quality and the return on the investment of their time networking. So here's how I do it. Key groups, I use LinkedIn and connecting. And I'm gonna share with you each one of these in a way that I think you might be able to adapt and utilize for your business. So key groups, six to eight people, all of whom you predetermine um, meet a certain criteria that make them worthy of your time to network with. And here's the criteria. Um, they know the people that you'd like to do business with. <laughs> That's an important one, right? So if you're going to put a group of people together to network with, it's important that they're actually connected to and have relationships with the people that you would like to be meeting. Two, are they relationship-driven people or are they transaction-driven? Three, are they trustworthy? That's a big one. Four, would they be committed to protecting the time that you spend to come together? And whether you're doing it weekly, bi-monthly, monthly, my experience has been that People who put their own groups of people together to network, they ultimately dissolve because they didn't think too much in advance about who they were inviting to spend that time with. They like them, they're good people, they're in business, so they figured that they could be a good referral partner, but being more discerning and not just liking them, but actually qualifying them, would they be committed? Do they know the type of people that you'd wanna meet? Are they givers? Are they relationship driven, et cetera? That's an important aspect of it. And then coming up with some regular schedule to interact with them, to develop those relationships and then figure out ways to connect each other outside of your key group. So key group is just another word that I use for your own personal networking group. LinkedIn. So I am about to share with you how I use LinkedIn. I'm not saying that this is how you should use LinkedIn, but I am going to share with you one of the ways that I use it to increase the quality of the referrals that I get. So the first step is I've ranked all of my LinkedIn connections as an A, a B, or a C, and I'll define for you what these mean. So an A is somebody like Bill Singer. 
Bill is someone that I am 100% confident. And Russell, you're an A2. Uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll know why in a second. So an A is somebody that I am completely comfortable to reach out to with no hesitation and ask for help with an introduction. They may or may not be able to actually help me with that introduction, but I have 100% confidence that Bill or Russell would get back to me and say, hey, Michael, I'm really sorry. I don't know that person, or actually I do know them. How can I help you? And A, I don't think twice about asking for their help. That's important. A B is somebody who's actually an A, but some period of time has gone by that it would be awkward if I just reached out to them. Russell, if I hadn't talked to you in seven years and all of a sudden you got a message from me that says, hey, I, know, I see you know Bill Singer, could you introduce me? That would just be, it would just wouldn't be right. right? We'd need to catch up first and, and warm up our relationship again. So Bs are actually A's that just need to be warmed up. And then a C is anybody who's off limits. And I write it that way because it can be someone you know really well, but for whatever the reason, you don't include them in any sort of outreach. And the example that I use is, uh, has everyone heard of Dollar Shave Club? Yes. They do a lot of that. They used to do a lot of advertising, sort of those funny commercials. So the creator of Dollar Shave Club is my first cousin, Michael Dubin. So we're connected on LinkedIn, but he's a C. I don't reach out to him. I don't ask him for connections. He's just my cousin. And my sense is that if everybody thought about their own personal network, there are people that you might know really well, but for whatever reason, you sort of don't cross that line. Another example of a C could be someone you're connected to and you just don't know who they are. And that's okay too. There's no right or wrong way to do this, but again, I'm sharing with you how I've used it. So I ranked all my relationships. Here were my results. I have a total of 616 total LinkedIn connections. And that number to some people is surprisingly low, but also keep in mind, I don't push out content. So I'm not trying to get people to come to my LinkedIn profile and read anything per se. I'm strictly using LinkedIn as an avenue to find connections to get those warm referrals. Master question? Yes. Well, I'm sure you get random people asking you to connect. Yes. I silly early on, I accepted everybody. I'm more, so I have too many people on my LinkedIn. I need to actually spend the time to delete some because they're just never going to happen. How do you handle that? Uh, it's a great question and I get it all the time. So the way I do it is um, I do not accept invitations from people that I don't know. And the, the real answer, <laughs> uh, take this for, for what you will, I will look at their profile and if they are somebody that I think would be good to add to my network potentially, I will respond to them and thank them for the invite let them know that I use LinkedIn in a very specific manner for my business. And before adding them, I would welcome the chance to get to know them better and see if we would be a good fit for each other or something like that. If I look at their profile and they don't look like somebody that frankly, I feel like I can help and they can help me, I just ignore it. So. That's, that's how I do it. And I went through the process, Russell, early on of thinning the herd. I mean, I had over a thousand, maybe 1200 connections. And as I started to evolve and how I used LinkedIn, I just started eliminating all those people that I really, sure. I didn't know. Sure. But again, if I'm, if I'm pushing out or publishing content or marketing material, different story, different story. And I want all the eyeballs I can get. If that is you, I would encourage you to just try and identify the A's within your network. Sure. So that you can focus on them. 
Make sense? Yes, thank you. Yep. So connecting, and what I mean by this is, back when we started Accelerant, I didn't realize the benefit that this would have or that I would realize in the future. But I found myself purposefully scheduling time to focus on connecting people. And what I mean by that is I was actually putting time on my calendar. I was blocking space on my calendar to specifically devote to figuring out who I could connect to whom in order to help each party. And what I found though is that over time, because I was doing that in a very purposeful manner, I started to, I, my perception in the marketplace changed and people started coming to me all the time and asking for help with specific connections. So I was no longer Michael Gordon, the regional guy for Accelerant. I was Michael, the person who was a connector and Michael who was bringing more value beyond the product or service I was selling. And over time, it just became more habitual. So whether it's with the clients that I'm serving, prospects that I'm trying to do business with, the people who are my best referral sources, those centers of influence, COI, or just other people in my world, it redefined how I behaved. And when I was interacting with people, my initial response was, who do you wanna be meeting? What does your ideal customer profile look like? What is a good opportunity look like for you? What problems do you solve that I should be listening for? And my perspective on relationship development became all about the give. It was all about the help. And it was never about what could I get from it. I certainly wasn't keeping score. But what I started to recognize was that by spending time purposefully asking people how I can help them, even if I couldn't, just by asking them, I was changing how I was perceived in the minds of those people around me who were in a position to help me. So I just started trying to connect wherever and with whomever I could. So here we're in the home stretch. So how can you increase your networking return on investment of time? Keep in mind, these are, these are places that my sense is if you are networking, you are probably spending some time in one of these and that's okay, they do work. Again, I'm just suggesting that there might be a more efficient and effective way to do it. But if you can keep these in mind, the people, the goal of the organization, what you actually talk about and avoiding empowering your competitors, here's what I think you can do. Find the right people. Right meaning people who are connected to the types of people you want to be doing business with. So not necessarily you connecting with just your prospects. Find those people who can feed you those warm referrals. When you're with them, make sure it's for the right reason. And it's okay to be open about it. Talk about why you're getting together with them. Talk about connecting, business development, sales, filling your funnel, everything related to growth. And this one's pretty obvious and I just felt like I needed a fourth one. Don't do it with your competitors, <laughs> right? Um, but you need to be careful because again, if you're in an environment where it's not always clear what someone does, because nowadays people do more than just what we think they do, be careful about who you're educating about your business. Focus on the quality of the relationship you're building, not the quantity. I've always been a huge proponent of the 80-20 principle. 80% 80 of my referrals come from 20% of my network. Quality over quantity. Whether you wanna use red, yellow, green for a traffic light or A's, B's and C's like I did, 
try and identify the A relationships in your network who fit the profile of somebody who can help you grow. And I would encourage you to focus your time and energy on them. Interact with those people who are in a position to help you on a regular basis. You define what regular means. Some of my networks meet weekly, some of them meet once a month. It really depends on what you think will work for you. And the reason to do that is to stay top of mind. Once you and your A's have established this understanding that you're in it to help each other, you can start including your external networks. Maybe you do a happy hour where each of you brings a guest that would be good for the rest of the group to meet. Nobody's selling anything. You're just connecting people in your network to other people in your network. Maybe you want to rent or, or just go to a restaurant and, and get a private room and do a group lunch of 10 people and some of your A's bring guests, or maybe you wanna to go to a sporting event and you know four or five, six of you go to the game and you're bringing some guests from outside your A network. But that's what I mean by including your external network. Focus on building the relationships and it doesn't have to be all business. When I get together with my A's, Generally, I'm talking about what's going on in their personal life as well as their professional life, both positive and negative. Are they struggling with something that maybe I can help them with? Would it just be cathartic for them to have somebody to tell what's happening in their world and just get it off their chest because they can't really tell their spouse or their employees or the people that, that they work with? So focus on building the relationships. Don't focus on just getting transactions. Be the giver, change the perspective of your network that you are someone who gives, you are someone who helps, you are someone who asks, how can I help you? And it doesn't just have to be with the service or product that I provide, what else do you need help with? Even if I can't help you, at some point maybe I can. It will change how you are perceived in the marketplace. And this is the last one. Don't be afraid to ask your network for help with business development and be specific as you can. Does anybody know company XYZ? I just cannot find a way to get in there. Versus I sell to government contractors or I sell to people in commercial real estate or I sell to fill in the blank. Be as specific as you can. And for some, I find that their ego gets in their way and they don't want to ask for help because that makes them feel weak, makes them feel like they don't have their, their stuff together. I would encourage you, let that, let that humble side come out. I'm asking for help all the time and my A's come to my rescue. So I would encourage you to ask for help, be specific, and these are the things in general that I find I do on a daily basis. And it works for me to develop new business. So that's the presentation. Um, I will escape from here. And I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Are you, are you doing this now as a, um, I, I met you with Accelerant. Is this a, a new venture for you? You're looking for uh, introductions to people that might be interested in, in getting a more in-depth education? So um, thank you for asking that. And I don't want this to come out like um, I'm soliciting the group. I'm just going to tell you. I'm I asked. I mean, right. I get it. Um, so I left Accelerant three years ago, actually this month. Network development systems is what I do to help people build and run their own key groups. The way I do it and the, the why behind it, if I can, is I didn't invent the concept of six or seven people getting together to network, right? That's been around a long time. But I believe that those groups fail for these reasons. One, they're choosing the wrong people. They're choosing people they like 
they're not qualifying them on the characteristics that I shared before. Two, if it was their idea to put a group together, they didn't realize they just signed up for a part-time job as meeting organizer, scheduler, planner. Three, when they get together, once everybody does their deep dive and they talk about their business, then what do we talk about? <laughs> right, just sort of, all right, now we're, we're out of steam. And then four, I believe that there are nuances when it comes to actually making quality introductions. And an example is if you're ever connected by me, it's because I've asked for permission to introduce you to the person that you wanted to meet. So if Russell, you wanted to meet Bill Singer because you saw I was connected to him on LinkedIn, sure. I would go to Bill, tell him that I have a friend named Russell Lacey. This is what he does. Here's why I would like to introduce him. I'd like your permission, Bill, but please feel free. <laughs> you know, Bill, you can feel free to say no thank you and you do not owe me an explanation. That's funny. So to me, that is a nuance as it relates to effective referral development and relationship building. So Russell, what I do today is I'm helping my clients build their group. I'm in their meeting to help them run their group. And then I'm working with them in between our monthly meeting to help them capitalize on the relationships we're building in the group. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for asking. I have a question. Yes. What advice would you give to someone that has trouble committing? They may want to be an A, but with life, their workload and everything else, it's hard for them to commit to such, um, to something that takes a lot of time, even though it may be once a month, but that's once a month that I could be doing X, Y, and Z. How do you kind of get them to weigh the pros and the cons of committing? Are you referring to yourself or you were- I'm yourself? asking for a friend. I am asking for a friend. Um, if so, not that it's you, but <laughs> if it was you, I would encourage, I would encourage that individual to really look inside and understand how important is business development to all the things they have to do. Mm -hmm if it's uh, in that upper tier of things of priorities that, that need to get done, I would, I would strenuously encourage them to make that time non-negotiable because business development to me never stops. It is an ongoing thing. And if it becomes something, Russell, thanks for the message. Um, if business development is something you think you're going to get to after you've finished everything else you need to do. You'll never get to it. You'll never. It's like the gym. If mm -hmm. I don't put it on my calendar, I find every other reason not to go. Your life is my life. We, I'm, I'm there with you. I get it. <laughs> um, so again, it's not about the quantity of time you're spending. If you can really determine who the people in your world are most capable and appropriate to get you that introduction to a decision maker, it might be less time than you actually think. Great point. Thank you so much. Michael, I've got, I'm not sure it's really a question, but maybe ask you to expand on some thoughts a little bit. One of the things that I think a lot of people struggle with um, uh, is, is um, getting to the ask, getting to be able to ask somebody for new business, being able to figure out a way to um, um, develop the conversation to lead to that goal. Um, expand a little bit because I feel like one of the things that you're bringing out in this conversation is that if, if instead of asking for the give or asking for uh, the help or asking for the, uh, the business, if you're a giver first and you establish that, 
it becomes much easier after you've established how can I help you to then be able to turn around and be able to ask for business from that person. Expand on that some, because I think that's a hurdle that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah, it's it's um, it's not a simple answer, and there are some dynamics to it that I think make it even more complicated. Um, the most simple way I think I can answer it is understanding the type of person that you're actually engaging with. And here's what I mean. So, Bill, if you're someone that I want business from, right, I sell air conditioning service work. And I know you've got properties with commercial air conditioning systems and somebody needs to come in there and, and service them. Uh, and I hope nobody on here is a commercial air conditioning service company. Um, but if I want that business from you and I'm not really sure how to ask you, just come out and ask you for it for whatever reason, I, if I'm going to take the approach that I think you're suggesting, which is let me try and introduce you to people that could be tenants of yours Right? So I'm going to send some goodwill your way and I'm going to refer you to people who I know their leases are expiring. They'd make a great tenant for your building. And my hope is because I've done that, you might invite me in to bid on your commercial air conditioning work. I would say if I don't know how you're wired, I might be doing that in the hopes that you're going to want to reciprocate and bring me value. But if I don't know for sure, I am setting myself up for a lot of heartache and like, hey, and disappointment. Hey, Bill, I just referred you somebody that signed a five-year lease in 2000 square feet of space. Come on, buddy, where's, where's the love? That might be my expectation, not realizing that's not even on your radar. It didn't even occur to you so A, being aware of who you are talking to and how they might be wired. B, if you're unsure, then we're getting into sales tactics on how to set appropriate expectations, which is a road that I'm very happy to talk about on how to have those conversations in a non-offensive, comfortable, mutual, beneficial way. Um, for example, if I was that air conditioning contractor, Bill, I might ask to meet with you and I would say, Hey, Bill, my sense is that what's important to you is rent roll. So what's important to me is servicing building owners like you. And if you're interested, I'd love to explore a relationship where I can introduce you to people that I know lease space. But if you're open to it, I'd also like to be put in a position where I can earn your air conditioning service work, is that a conversation you'd be open to having? That is sales tactics on how to have a conversation with a prospective buyer. But if I don't know how you're wired, maybe you're the type of the person that's just altruistic. And if I refer to you somebody that leases space, you're gonna call me in and say, Michael, I've been working with Fidelity Mechanical for a hundred years. They've never referred me a single tenant. I've met you once, you've referred me someone. I'd like you to come in and talk with us about our service work, or you may be that person. So long answer, complicated question, but a lot of it has to do with who you are talking to and your understanding of how they might be wired. Cool, excellent answer, thank you. Do you ever help people do, I don't know another word for it, but it's like your ideal client avatar where you help them? Because I feel like for what I've learned through networking is like sometimes you have to do a little more digging, like you were saying about the psychology of like, if you want somebody in, to invest with Kenwood, for example, like where are they hanging out? What are their deepest um, like concerns in the world? And you know, what are, what are their stresses and who do they hang out with so that you can kind of get in front of them and start to kind of build relationships there? Is that part of the work you do? Um, it's not so much. It's more helping people get to the point where they can actually have that conversation. So let's use the Kenwood example that you just used. And I think I'm understanding your question. 
if Bill wanted to get in front of you, Holly, to talk about their investment strategy, lots of small tenants, not putting all their eggs in one basket, their historical return to their investors, they've never lost a building, et cetera. The work that I do would be to help Bill get in front of you to have that conversation about how you're wired. It wouldn't be to help Bill figure out in advance, Holly is on these boards and she has a diverse real estate investment portfolio. Here's how I find that out. These are the things that she's interested in. It's less about identifying the things that make you you. It's more about getting Bill to you so that he can find that out. Got it. Is, was that the answer? Is that? That makes sense. Yeah. So no, I'm, I'm not helping people profile their ideal client profile. I think when I go into networking events, sometimes I'm unclear, like who would be a good person to talk to so I could tell them how great Kenwood is and how much we like taking care of our buildings and taking care of people and wire management style is different. And so, so here, here's, here's what I would share with you and a, a way you might position it. And the concept is called third party storying. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that all of you could do this in your world. And um, Bill, if you want, I will send you a template of this uh, that you can share with, with the people that are on here or anybody that, that wants it. But it's basically, um, and I'm going to do this on the fly, so no prep. So if I'm Kenwood Management and I'm at a networking event, it's really your elevator speech. But you're going to do it in a way that instead of you talking about the features and benefits of Kenwood management, you're going to tell a third party story about what your clients think. So it might sound something like, I'm Michael Gordon with Kenwood management, right? right? You've walked up to someone or they've walked up to you and you're having this conversation. I'm Michael Gordon, I'm with Kenwood management. We are real estate owners and managers. Typically our investors have a diverse portfolio and they like real estate to be a part of that portfolio. Or typically they are risk averse in the public markets and they're looking for slightly more aggressive but still relatively safe investments in real estate is a place that they find a lot of comfort. The concept is to to use the two or three things that your clients struggle with and tell the person you're talking to, typically my clients struggle or my clients are interested in A, B, or C. So it's not you telling someone what you do, you're telling someone what someone else says or Their does experience of Kenwood. Right. yeah that makes sense and what it what it does psychologically to the listener is it takes them off of defense right what's holly trying to sell me mm -hmm. holly's just telling me what her existing clientele engage her service for and if you can say it in a way that you're just you're just stating what other people are saying mm -hmm without coming across like, and oh, by the way, if you need you that should, too, should, yeah. right, then it'll allow them, but, but those two or three things you come up with, they should be things you know most people right. would struggle with. Right, yeah, that's a good point. Right. So if I'm a mechanical contractor and I meet Bill at a networking event, I'm gonna say, Bill, I'm Fidelity Mechanical, we do all sorts of mechanical work, and typically our clients they have immediate response time needs and their existing contractor takes five to 10 hours to get there. Or they have mission critical infrastructure that needs to have some sort of a backup plan in the worst case scenario, should they lose power, whatever that story might be. So I'm not saying that that's what I do and I'm great at it. What I'm saying is typically the clients that I work with, these are the things they're most concerned about. And if that's a concern for you, I'd be happy to talk with you about it. Yeah. That's much more pleasant a conversation, it feels like. Yeah, and it's just, again, it's you're telling what somebody else says about you. And if you can find your humility chromosome and deliver it that way, 
uh, it comes off very offense, offense, not offense, defense. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? No. Nope. Karen, you, you've been kind of quiet. No. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, Michael, thank you so much for this. This has been awesome. Some terrific information. Um, and I think um, I can speak from my own perspective. The first times that I heard this out of you, I mean, it was completely new in perspective of what I, uh, how I viewed things. So I found it incredibly helpful. So hopefully everybody else does. Thank you again. Uh, everybody, thanks for attending today's Lunch and Learn event. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you Thank so you much. Everybody. Thank you, Bill. Yep.